Please welcome Mackenzie Thomas from Google and Elizabeth Kilpatrick from the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Mackenzie. What I love so much about that video is how it just showed all these badass women in everyday life. They were doing awesome things in sports, in media, in entertainment. And every day when we see ourselves, whether it's in the movies, whether it's in office, um, we, we ask ourselves, is this the person that we want to be? For me, growing up, every day, I would wake up at 5 a.m. and watch two back-to-back, hour-long episodes of ESPN Sports Center. You might be thinking that from 5 to 6 and from 6 to 7, these episodes were different. But actually, no, they were exactly the same. There were two real reasons. One, I really did love sports. But two, talking sports at school was an easy way for me to get the guys to stop bullying me for being, well, really, really nerdy. So I memorized NBA, NFL, NBA, MLB scores every single day. And then we discussed them. So at school, I'd go in and I'd rattle off who shot the most three-pointers last night. And somehow the guys decided to stop bullying me. But what I realized, weirdly enough, was that my childhood heroes were never on screen. We didn't see them any day, anywhere. The Mia Hams, the Brianna Scurry, the Lisa Leslies, they never showed up on ESPN each morning. Instead, we <clears throat> saw men, left and right. What I realized now is that thankfully this is beginning to change. We're seeing women on ESPN, we're seeing women in the news, but we can do more. When I fast forward a little bit, I recall myself in college and in high school and watching a lot of Grey's Anatomy in my parents' basement. Maybe some of you also did the same thing. <laughs> and at the time, I saw for the first time Callie in Arizona uh, on Grey's and I paused for a moment and I realized that I, for the first time, saw myself as a femme queer woman on screen. For me, that visibility was so crucial. It helped me come out and undoubtedly helped me realize the importance of intersectionality too. So yet again, thank you, Shonda. <laughs> the importance of visibility is why we're all here today. We know it's important and we want to realize it in every single day. So at Google, when we think about inclusive marketing, it's two, really two things. First, representation. <coughs> how many women, how many black individuals, how many people with disabilities are present in our work? And second, portrayal. How are these people shown? Is it in a positive light? Are they at the forefront or are they more in the background? The first piece is definitely more quantitative and the second piece is a bit more qualitative. So we've teamed up with the Gina Davis Institute and Elizabeth here today to better dig into and understand that first part of the equation, representation and advertising. Good morning. So the Gina Davis Institute has been a partner with Google for so long that I joke that I'm an honorary Google employee simply because I have experienced the amazing thing that they call lunch in about 10 different facilities. <laughs> um, we initially came together in a collaboration with the USC School of Engineering to create what we call the GDIQ. Does anybody know what GD probably stands for? Gina Davis, inclusion quotient. This is a machine learning tool that uses facial and audio recognition to dive deep into on-screen representation. And it has really changed the entire way analysis of media content is done. But today we're talking advertising, which is also a big part of our work. Did you know that the average person sees between 4,000 and 10,000 ads a day? So yesterday, I may or may not have been a little nervous about this, so I may or may not have been practicing it in the car <laughs> on the way to the airport, and I was like, 4,000 to 10,000, that's a lot. Let me look around, is that really true? I got that stat from Google, and they're always right. <laughs> um, so just in the 10 minutes that it took me to get from my house to the freeway, I saw 300 ads, and I was convinced, okay. That's the case. Now, I think that one of the, well, one of the things at the Gina Davis Institute we focus on is eliminating unconscious bias because people, for the most part, want to do a good job. And I think most um, creatives and marketers think that they're representing the world and are inclusive in the material that they create. However, 72% of people 
do not feel like they're represented in the ads that they see. 72%. So it was just a few years ago that I actually saw myself represented in media for the very first time. And you guys may be like, what? You're a white woman. Y'all are all over the place. But first of all, I'm over 50, and that's when every woman disappears. But um, <laughs> we're not even talking about that. We're talking about the fact that five years ago, I lost 200 pounds. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm going to get all clamped. No. <laughs> and um, like a year and a half after that, and this was at the time I'd already been working with the Gina Davis Institute for like five years. I was watching somebody on TV, and for the first time, it was like, that's me. And I realized that I had never seen myself represented before, unless it was in some crazy reality show. And then just last week, uh, I was sitting at a hotel, and I actually saw Chrissy Metz, who plays the character of Kate on This Is Us. So I literally sprinted barefoot across the hotel lobby to go and talk to her, and why I was barefoot is a whole other story for another presentation. But um, I want to, and I'm sure she knows this, but I wanted to tell her the impact of the role she is playing is so huge. She is changing what so many overweight, girl, um, ah, overweight girls and women think they deserve, that they deserve love and marriage and sex and children and to be performers, and it's huge. And I so wish that I had known that about myself earlier, and it would have eliminated a lot of bad boyfriends. <laughs> so, that being said. <laughs> it's just what you all do is so powerful. And I think there's a quote that says, with power comes great responsibility. Um, so let me tell you what we did. We partnered with Google on the largest advertising study ever conducted on gender representation in advertising. We just released this last year. We looked at 2.7 million YouTube ads uh, that accounted for 562 billion views in 52 countries in 11 verticals. That's a lot of data. Our research team is geeking out about, <laughs> they have just touched the surface on this and they're geeking out about all the things we're gonna come up with this. I'm just gonna hit on a couple of quick stats, but I encourage you guys to go look at our website at cjane.org and look at the full report and play around with the infographics because you can look at verticals and you can look at countries and all that thing. So I encourage you guys to do that. So <laughs> what did we learn? Well, Wade kind of set this up for me. Um, but you know that thing where he was talking about convincing people of the business case? That's probably about 50% of my job. <laughs> so, um, but this first finding really speaks to that. So what we found was when we had gender balanced ads, when female characters were at least equal to male characters in the ad, they received 30% more views. That's pretty incredible. And so what does that tell us? That tells us that when you're inclusive and you're creative, people will tune in. It tells you that there is an appetite for these stories that really reflect the diverse and complex life of audiences. And it tells you that girls and women should make up at least 50% of the picture. In terms of overall representation, well, there's still a little bit of work that needs to be done there. Um, in terms of screen time, men were on screen 56% of the time, and they were speaking 60% of the time. So those stats are very consistent with what we generally find when we look at TV and movies. So it wasn't a huge surprise. And then when we break it down by the verticals, females were especially missing in automotive, business, and industrial ads. And entertainment and media wasn't doing that great of a job either with 38% female representation. We did have gender parity in CPG, retail, and healthcare. So that's great. So we're making progress, but there's a lot of work left to do. One of the things that I want to touch on um, before I turn it back over to Mackenzie is the tools that we use are only able to look at binary gender, gender binary. Um, they can only classify and label based on 
cisgender men and cisgender women. So we know that we need to develop more inclusive models and teach these tools how to see the full spectrum of what our society is. We, um, at the Gina Davis Institute, a few years ago, we expanded from just looking at gender to looking at race, disability, and LGBTQ. We did a 10-year benchmark study of popular films last year, and we found that disabled people and LGBTQ made up less than 1% of the characters of popular films. Less than 1%. So we have a lot of work to do, and I have to say that I am, we at the Institute and I personally am so excited to work with you guys on making this happen. I usually see the finished product. That's how we work, we're benchmarking things. But putting this presentation together with Mackenzie, it has been so fascinating, and I've been so moved by the work that you all are doing internally to make this happen. So congratulations. <laughs> so as a, <laughs> Elizabeth really just underscored there's really this importance and this quote that we really champion at Google, the importance of if we don't intentionally include, we will unintentionally exclude. And this comes up at every single stage of the creative process, from the brief stage all the way through that final execution. At Google, if we're building products for everyone, we of course want to make sure that we're also marketing for everyone and that everyone feels included. Over the past few years, we have been pushing beyond gender, as Elizabeth mentioned as well, um, to acknowledge these other aspects of identity too, race, ability, sexual orientation. And a few years ago when we began this benchmarking, the numbers really were not so good. Over the last few years though, we have seen some progress. So we'll rewind a little bit and see what's been done. So first, when we look at how women are showing up in our work, we have been seeing this dramatic increase um, in how women have been showing up percentage-wise. We're not at that 50%, but we're really inching close to that. And we know to even push it even beyond that, we wanna make sure that women are speaking more and they're actually portrayed as the same age as their male counterparts, as opposed to predominantly younger, which is what we're seeing today. Beyond gender, though, we've been looking through the lenses of race, sexual orientation and ability as well. And we've increased the number of black individuals that are shown in our ads to a point that's actually greater than the percentage of the US population. We see that as a huge win. However, now we wanna make sure that we're pushing that even further and making sure that everyone within the black community, whether you have lighter skin or darker skin is also shown in our ads. Additionally, we want to ensure that we're not stereotyping as well. So right now, about a third of the time, if you're black, you're seeing yourself in our work through the lens of sports, entertainment, or dance. We want to remove that lens, and we want to push beyond that. Our Latinx representation, despite the fact that the Latinx community is hugely growing in the United States, is not up to that bar either. So this is, again, becoming a huge priority for us. And like many brands, we've championed LGBTQ equality and representation during Pride. And now we wanna make sure that we're extending it more and more throughout all 12 months of the year and not only highlighting cisgender gay white men. And finally, when we think about ability, for the last few years, we've been incredibly forward thinking as it relates to accessibility. Now we want to ensure that we're both working with and casting members of the disability community with both visible and invisible disabilities. So how do we get to this point and how have we been moving forward? We realize that a lot of people just really want to take a step back and listen and learn. That's why you're all here today, and that's really what we've acknowledged at Google as well. However, to do inclusive marketing requires real deep understandings of race, privilege, and gender. So every marketer at Google now goes through a multi-hour inclusive marketing training, ensuring that they're growing that muscle of understanding. And it's not stopping there. We know that all of our work is built with many brands and agencies like you all. And thus, many of our agency partners are also coming on board and joining us in doing these trainings as well. So BBH, Arts and Letters, and Hook have all trained all of their employees with us, which is awesome. But it goes beyond that. Many times, teams want to really ask us, how do we get this right from that brief stage, again, all the way through final execution? And th that requires being super hands-on. Historically, as many of you know, marketers who are often from underrepresented backgrounds 
who were often some of our more junior employees, were put on the spot. They were asked to provide feedback because someone who looked like them, who had the same sexual orientation or the same gender was present in the ad. So someone turned to them and said, what do you think of this? Inevitably, that puts people in incredibly uncomfortable and power dynamic fueled situations. So we're solving that problem, moving to a place of more shared accountability. Last year, we launched a group called the Inclusive Marketing Consultants that I co-lead with my colleague, Raphael. Together, a group of 50 diverse Google Googlers, all of whom volunteer their time, so it's an opt-in program, review work every single week from brief stage all the way through that final deliverable. And we're asking teams to get super specific and really understand who their user is. With that, oftentimes when we see casting documents, we'll see things like racially ambiguous or diverse family. We now really push teams and ask them what that really means. So when you say diverse family, are you saying a multi-generational family? Or are you saying two gay white dads living in Silicon Valley? Usually it's neither of those. And what people are actually saying is that they want a family that's not white. So why is it that this default of white is always present and anything other that, than that is just considered diverse? So instead, really understand who that user is, recognize that, grab that insight, and write that in the brief. So when you want to focus on Latina women age 18 to 34, write that in your casting document. Earlier this year, we were reviewing a Super Bowl spot. It was a few days before the Super Bowl, and this group was, had stepped in to review a cut of an ad. Though it was great that we were heroing this Latina woman, it was a win on the representation side. As we dug a little bit deeper, we realized that the portrayal of this woman was stereotypical and quite negative. So just a few days before the biggest advertising moment of the year, we pulled the ad. Though this costs, of course, a ton in time and money and energy, and for many folks, they would think that this is an unthinkable decision. I actually see this as a huge step forward. We were owning the fact that we needed to be inclusive, especially on the biggest stage. Most teams, though, never touch an ad during the Olympics or the Oscars or the Super Bowl. So what does inclusive marketing generally look like? Many of you today have probably seen images like this. Emojis, avatars for your social media networks, sketches, even bathroom signs. We see these illustrations come to us consistently from UX designers or from creative teams. And with that, what most of these images are yet again showing is this default of a white person. And usually that person is a man as well. So now when we're reviewing illustrations, teams are coming to us being much more intentional about this, really challenging who that person is and removing that default as well. Beyond that, we've been looking at lots of websites as well. So earlier this year, we, when we worked with our Grow with Google team for the launch of a program for the Latinx community, they moved beyond just translations into Spanish. But they actually built partnerships with community partners like the League of United Latin American Citizens. And they were super intentional with that launch, also going forth with a Latinx focused media strategy. For events, we teamed up with GLAAD to make sure that registration forms were more inclusive of gender, allowing folks to select as many options as they choose and also always fill in the option that works best for them. And for many of our six second and 15 second spots, we're reviewing things like casting, as you know, but we're also pushing beyond that and making sure that we're also looking at VO and music. So for an earlier spot this year, we wasn't this one, but another one, we were reviewing this, this one set of 15 second spot with the team. And what we noticed was that everyone in the ad was a woman, that was great. They're all women and mothers in this, in this spot. However, the voiceover, the narrator was a man's voice. You may ask this question of why is a man narrating this group of women's lives? And we had this really in intellectual conversation with the team about that. Ultimately, this team recognized that they could be innovating a little bit further on this. And when they recently did their casting for their second wave of the campaign, they were super deliber deliberate about casting both with regard to gender and also race. 
So the wave that came out last week actually had the voiceover of a black woman. This is crucial because we can't only focus on who's on screen, but also who's heard, who's behind the scenes, and we need to be paying those folks as well. A lot of this work requires constant reminders. So the posters that you see here are now spread across all of our offices, reminding folks at every stage of the creative process, you can make an intentional decision to be more inclusive. And finally, what a lot of these consultant practices realized was that we needed to build some resources, whether that's guidelines or photos. And that's because last year, when we reviewed a lot of this content, we realized that there were many, many, many white hands. And these were present in our social media, in our ads, in our app store screenshots. It was persistent. So a team said, this is not hard. We can fix this. So they built a series of photographs that allows anyone to drop in screenshots into a phone and quickly make their both internal and external work more inclusive. But it's not just about phones and apps. Obviously, we have a lot of hardware as well. And with that, we took it a step further. And we asked ourselves, how could we build a broader set of inclusive stock photography? We did this in partnership with Ad Color, with Tonal, and a couple of disability and LGBTQ nonprofits. And all of the beautiful people that you're seeing on screen here are real people. None of them are models. They could be models, but none of them are models. They're real couples, they're friends, they're parents. And these shots were done with creative agencies that were led by individuals identifying as queer, black, and women, ensuring diversity on every single side of the camera. Eventually, of course, we aspire for all of our photography to do this and to be this inclusive, not just this one database. So with that, I'm really excited to dig into what's ahead. We know that we have a long ways to go and we're thankful for each of you and every one of your support. Whether it's MAPE and Ad Color supporting us and our emerging leaders, or 3% pushing us for gender equity in the creative spaces, it's all of our jobs to really stand up, step up, and sometimes step back and just listen and learn. So that's why today I'm super excited for the first time to publicly announce three of our goals for Google as it relates to inclusive marketing. You're getting a little peek behind the curtain here. So first, we want to make sure that we're reaching parity in the representation of women. Second, we want to reach proportional representation of Latinx users. And finally, we want to eliminate stereotypes of black and Latinx users. Though there's a lot of nuance behind each of these, and obviously they connect as well, we want to ensure that we're sharing them publicly in hopes that you'll hold us accountable, but also that you'll take the steps within your organizations as well to be more intentional about your work going forward too. I'm super excited and optimistic that we can move the needle on this work and push us to be more accountable. There's been this catchphrase that's been going around a little bit. I saw it on a shirt, someone else saw it on social media. It's making its rounds. To be the person you needed when you were younger. For me, this kid needed someone who was an out queer woman who was confidently both nerdy and athletic, and maybe a little bit stronger in her convictions too. So I hope that each of you will think about that lens and bring and be the person that we each needed but also who today that our world and this industry needs as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to a video from some of our friends and our brand studio team that was released earlier this year. Thank you. <laughs> 